And I remember being there. We had no outbound exchange. And this would have been maybe 2001. It was a regional university. And I remember these two human movement students, Australian students coming into my office. And they said, we've just been to China and we've been studying for a year in China and they had a transcript in Mandarin. Do you think we could get credit for what we're doing? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I had no idea what they were talking about. Anyway. Welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. Tell me first about how you got into international education. Tell us a bit about your career trajectory and uh, what got you there. Fantastic. Look, thank you. Thank you so much for asking me. I'm a very passionate storyteller, so you're probably going to have to edit quite a bit of this. I'm going to step right back as to how I got into international education because it really is way back in and my passion for travel. And what I really love about the people I work with in international education and yourselves included is there really isn't a linear path to people who work in this sector. So I'll tell my story. It'll be unique as is everybody's. So way, way back when I was a kid, wasn't big traveling then. You know, we used to have camping holidays and things like that. But two things that really impacted impacted me when I was younger. One was that my mum, when she was 16, lived in West Africa in the Gambia because my grandfather went and set up trade unions there. And that was the story that I wanted to hear. I always wanted to hear that story about Africa, in which would have been then in the 40s. The other impact, I guess, or influence for me, I wasn't a big reader as a kid. I certainly wasn't particularly bright or academic but we had an atlas at home and it was a very old atlas and to age it most of the countries were colored in pink because you know that was the British Empire days and I used to pour through this atlas and I was absolutely fascinated and try and pronounce country names in uh, the place names in Russia and things like that and I don't really know where that came from so I had a real almost an obsessive interest in places other than where I was. That was a seed, I guess, that was sown. And then I left school at 16. Nobody suggested I stay on or do anything to any further education, which is quite ironic. And I went and worked in, a, in an insurance company filing, which was mind-numbingly boring. And then one day in the Birmingham Evening Standard, I grew up in the UK, there was an advertisement. And I wish to this day that I had kept this advertisement. It was very small. Birmingham Evening Standard and it said girls, girls, girls want to travel the world, come to the Metropole Hotel at six o'clock tonight. Now having daughters, I just horrified. Anyway, I thought, well that looked fantastic. That's exactly the kind of career move. So I went along to the Metropole Hotel And I got the job, not entirely sure what it was. It wasn't worst case scenario, which I'm sure everyone is imagining. And I was 16 years old. I think I lied about my age. I looked about 11. Turn post, I got a one-way ticket on a boat to Denmark. I don't know that I knew where Denmark was, but we went up to Newcastle. How my parents let me get on that boat, but I think they knew they had to let me. So that was my first kind of foray into overseas and the unknown. And I worked for a sales company for about two years, traveling Scandinavia, incredibly naive, but that was all it took. It was, you know, that travel bug. And from there, there was a bit of a, and I'm talking late 70s, so you two probably weren't born, but there was a little bit of a, a kind of a route that people did then. One was to go on a kibbutz in Israel. That was my next thing. I went on a kibbutz in Israel and there I met Mostly people who were taking their gap year. So they were doing between high school and university. Whereas for me, working in the olive field was, you know, my my latest career move. It certainly wasn't a gap year for me. But it got me meeting other people. And I met some Australians and they were one, good looking, two, really cool and laid back and three, tanned. And I write, that's, I'm going to Australia. These people are really cool. And I met a bunch of people and it's really interesting. I think there are moments in your life where you meet... It, just things, stars align, you're in the right mindset, you meet a group of people who are similarly in the same space in their life, probably about, and this is 45 years on, probably about 50% of the people I know and associate with are somehow either directly related to that experience back in 1979, or one, you know, one connection away from that. So that was a really quite an amazing time. Came back from that, 
had a fantastic time, came back from that. And the next thing was obviously getting to Australia. And in those days, to get a working holiday visa, you had to have £2,000 in your bank account to prove you could support yourself. We're very familiar with being able to support yourself in Australia. And the next thing to do was you'd go to Iceland and work in a fish factory and get some cash together. So off I went to Iceland, worked in a fish factory for a year, got my money together. That was another amazing experience right up in the northwest fjords of Iceland. We flew in in September. Everything was cut off. Roads were cut off. Flights were cut off. 24 hours a day, pitch black. And again, not knowing much about where I was going. I I was just, I just said yes to experiences and learned as I went along. So that was pretty exciting in itself, but it also gave me the means to get over to Australia and get my my working holiday visa for Australia. Not dissimilar to kind of what you did with the, you know, student exchanges, which I'll come to in a moment. So I came to Australia, went through Asia, came to Australia, hitchhiked around Australia, had an amazing time. Before the plane landed, I was flying in from Kuala Lumpur I had a window seat and I remember as the plane came over, I think it it would be somewhere in central Australia, but there was a red road with a lorry on it, a truck on it, and I wanted to be on a road like that, which I was within a week, live in Australia before the plane landed. Everything about Australia I just loved, the freedom, the food, the climate, the people, the environment. I just loved it. And as I say, before the plane landed, I thought I'm going to live there. And it took me another 10 years, which I won't take your time up with there. But but 10 years later, I did come back and live in Australia. Joe, I've got to interrupt you there. I I love your story. What strikes me is I think you were so brave because as you said, you didn't know much about where you were going um, time and again, whether it's, I guess, the kibbutz in Israel or then the fish factory in Ireland, they're coming to Australia. And, and, And there was no, I mean, there was no internet. It was hard to find you know, the information wasn't readily available like it is now. What do you think gave you the courage to go by yourself so young and just try so many things? Look, that's such a good question. And I'd love to say that I was brave, but in reality, I think I was unbelievably naive. I had a, a wanderlust. I definitely had a wanderlust. Everything was an adventure. And, and I think in some ways that naivety was my best tool in my toolkit because I didn't have preconceived impressions. I very much lived in the moment. I was somewhat lucky, but I was, you know, I was a bit street savvy. I didn't, you know, say yes to absolutely everything, especially hitchhiking around Australia. But I I just was very interested in where I was, what was around. And as I say, I think, and, and the reason I told that Atlas story and and my mum's story, because I think that was the seed. I I just somehow knew that there were these other lives elsewhere. And, you know, if I'd stayed in my village in the UK, I'd be working for that insurance company. I'd be married to Rob Rowe, both of which would have been horrendous. Just knowing that there were these other possibilities out there, I don't know, but, but I think so. It all comes back to a sense of curiosity, then. Curiosity. There was a bit of bravery, and it's interesting because I talk to my kids quite a bit about this. My daughter, who is with one of our exchange students in France, so can't really complain about that. Very aligned with you two. So she lives in France now. But if something happens to her, she texts me live. You know, it's like, Mum, I'm in Normandy and the Uber hasn't turned up. I'm there going, nothing I can do. When I was traveling, if anything happened, I had to write a letter to my parents, which took about three weeks to get there. Then I had to anticipate a post restante I might be at in six weeks time for them to reply. So you didn't go, you didn't write home and say you were having a hard time. You you know, there, there was no point because by the time anybody ever found out, you were in your next stage, in your, your next chapters. I think we had to live with our own means much more. I feel incredibly privileged and grateful that, that that I wasn't super connected and I didn't have all the information at my fingertips because it meant that I could go into things, yes, naively, but also open. Oh, there, there, we're, we're, both we're like... fighting over the microphone here. You, you've had your, my, my turn, my turn. You think you know a person, right? Joe, I've known you for like 15 years. And straight away, I love that's loving this podcast that suddenly in just the space of minutes, I have this whole other dimension to you. I mean, we've never shared that story before. It's brilliant. But what I really loved was how you've got this origin story around the, the Atlas and how it's just this, this flash of a moment from when you were a kid that in fact has this repercussion through your whole life. And I'm fascinated by these moments. Do you, do you have another one of those kind of moments where 
that, that you've managed to pin down and you're like, oh yeah, I am the way I am because of this little thing that happened when I was a kid. Do you have another one? I think so. I mean, I think I think seeds are sown. And, and when we work with our students, even the students who seemingly have a rotten time, I always think to myself, because I eventually I got into outdoor education, uh, experiential learning, and that's how I eventually got into international education. So I used to take people on outback trips and they were university students. That's my, you know, eventually I, I, I went to university at 31 years old and got my master's degree in outdoor education. And I was very aware that we can't see seeds and you draw on those things much later in your life. I'm sometimes I get frustrated with you know we do a lot of surveys and we do surveys immediately after an event occurs and sometimes we might have a six month gap or even a year gap but I'm still I'll be 64 next birthday I'm still drawing on events and situations that happened to me decades ago that I now and the reason I tell the story about being in a kibbutz and being in a fish factory and various other things that I did is because that was actually one of the best foundations for me to work in international education because I understood cultural literacy. I understood being a very grateful visitor to other people's countries. And I also understood, before I knew the terminology, reverse culture shock. Because when I went back to my hometown, nobody wanted to know about what I'd done. No one was, show me your photos of an inside of an Icelandic fish factory. Not interested at all. So I think that gave me a very, very strong basis. But most of all, it gave me the ability to know what to do when things go wrong and build resilience. Because if you're traveling and traveling on a budget and, you know, relying on backpacking, you know, if I bought something to put in my backpack, I had to throw something exactly the same size away. That's a principle I've tried to stay living with even today. And I've got a house, you know, and, and, and a van. But I like that. I like that you have to think about what you accumulate in your life and you have a finite space. There, You know, I did that for eight years with a backpack. I really, really had to think about things that you acquired. And also, things didn't go your way. I was three days in Saskatchewan with my thumb out and not a car went past. So it's all about what you do when things go wrong. Nobody has to work at what you do when things go right. But when things go wrong, you've got to have a bit of a toolkit. You've got to utilise time well, make sure that you know, if you are stuck somewhere on the side of the road or at an airport or wherever, you have some resilience, but you also, you can have an innate ability to entertain yourself. So I think that's really important. I've got a self-interested question there, but given that we've got kids that are nearly teenage years, what do you reckon is the way to teach that, I guess, to kids and teenager in today's world, given that, as you said earlier, now we've got so much more at our fingertips and yet still give them that sense of, I guess not just freedom and independence, but of having to rely on their own self and learning to push their boundaries and to deal with events that don't go their way and then and, and stand back up and go and try again. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think first and foremost, your kids look at you. And sometimes I'm, I, I've got three children and two stepchildren and I did in 1984, I did a cycle trip around, a solo cycle trip around England. England is that big. My son, when he was the same age, he did a cycle trip from Alaska to Central America solo. And I kept saying, have you had a look at the map? Because that's, that's not like my trip. I think that seed was very much sown in my eldest son. And he, he is a real purist, even though he works actually in a, the technology industry. He has no social media. He loves my stories of that, you know, not being connected with everything. And he's definitely, he lives in, in Central America now. He's got that same wanderlust, but in, a, in what I call a bit of a purist way. I know that sounds um, a bit superior, but I think it is. And so I think, first of all, they kind of see what you're doing. I think the other thing, and I've done it with my kids and I've done it with colleagues and, and people I work with and students, is when people come with a problem, and it's very hard as a, as a mother and as a parent, but when they come with a problem, to turn around and say, well, what are you going to do about it? That is because you've got the solution, especially as a parent, or, you know, and especially if you're a boss or you're the, you know, you're talking to a, a student or something like that, you're in your head, you can't help go you need to be doing this. 
But to turn around and go, okay, I hear you. What are you going to do about it? And not come up with a solution. And there was a, as a parent, there was a very, very important day. My kids were about, I was a single parent with, with my two boys and I had a combi van and we used to go out camping all the time. And I used to say, right, you pack your stuff. And I remember we were heading off one one weekend for a trip and the boys must have been, I reckon they were about seven and nine or something like that. And they said they'd packed and I could see they hadn't packed any raincoat, any warm jackets. And I said, have you got everything? And they're going, yes. And and I knew it, it was going to rain. We lived in, you know, the subtropics and I knew it would be cold. And everything in my body, every cell in my body wanted to just throw in that jumper and that raincoat. And I didn't. But they are, I only had to do that once. They were cold, they were wet, they were miserable, and I didn't save them. So sometimes I think it's a lot about what you don't do. Now, that sounds like I did that all the time. There were many, many times that, you know, I saved my kids and I probably still am now and they're in their 30s. But letting people make their own mistakes, I, th I think that's really important. And you can somehow contrive and control the setting. So you make it reasonably safe you you know you certainly don't want death at the end of the spectrum but you know you've worked and I, you, you know what you do you, you are only learning if you're out of your comfort zone if you're in your comfort zone there's no learning if you're too far out of your comfort zone in the danger zone you're just in fear but you've got to be out of your comfort zone and that's everything about international education. One of the first things that our students are doing, whether it's our students going overseas or bringing in students here, is they've stepped out of their comfort zone and that, and they're in their learning curve. So I don't know if that is your question, but that's probably the... No, that was, that was a very good answer, actually. Yeah, I, I, I can really relate to what you're saying. And yeah, I think it's good to hear someone say, like, we know it, but I think sometimes it's good to have someone remind you of it because I think as a parent, it's so easy to to overlook and to switch and to go and provide the solutions. And I think it's good to remind yourself of that from time to time. So, so can I take can I take that sort of similar conversation thread and push that towards like the work domain? A, a leader that I very much respect once said to me, "You should never answer a question. You can ask questions in response, but you should never answer a question for one of your Not subordinates." In the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that does not apply to podcasts. <laughs> but but of course that like creates so much discomfort in 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 some people. But do you have some any sort of tips or things that that you've been a leader for a long time now in the industry? Things that have worked for you in terms of managing staff who who've been working for you to to foster that sense of proactivity and self reliance. Yeah, look, I think it's a really good question. And I think it's a good question for the era we live in now. Well, I think going back to what I say, when people come in, I, I think my staff that subordinate to me, that, that come to me, learn pretty quickly everywhere I've worked, that you can't go in with a problem to Joe. You've got to come in, you can come in with a problem, but you've got, got to come in with two or three solutions. And I will help through questioning exactly what you say, Rob. I'll help through questioning, help you come to which of those would maybe the best path to take, but it won't be Joe's path. And I think that's really important. So because you want to you want to teach self-efficacy and, you know, I, I love pe watching people rise and overtake me. And, you know, I'm towards the end of my career and I really like see, seeing people, younger people develop. So I think that that sense of responsibility is really, really important. So yes, asking good questions and going back, you know, well, wh what are you thinking about doing about that and very quickly people stop coming in with just their problems because you you create that if you constantly solve people's problems whether it's children students staff whatever then you will get lots and lots of people coming to you with problems because you you, you create a kind of learned helplessness if you like just helping people and coming from experiential education where you're creating an environment of discovery and there is nothing more exciting you might know the answer to something and it's very easy to tell people but you cut short that bit between the not knowing and the finding out and that's the exciting bit. That's that's why we're all sitting here now is because at some stage in our life, we didn't know about something. And then we went through quite painful, getting it wrong, failing fast, hopefully failing fast, and then getting it right and sometimes incrementally. And then you own it. Then it's yours. 
Have you learned a technique to hold yourself back? As you're speaking, I can hear all of the truth in what you're saying, but at the same time, I can also picture myself sitting in front of, you know, people asking those questions and saying to myself, I know the answer, I should just tell them, it's so easy. And having that self-restraint is actually what creates the magic that you're talking about. So have you learned some techniques that have been helpful to you in holding yourself back from answering that question? Yes, yes. And it's going to sound like I'm, you know, some guru in it because I'm talking about where I am now. This took a long time to get there. Silence is the best technique. Taking a breath while someone's talking, sometimes counting, you know, right? Because on the tip of my tongue is, you just need to do this. Can't you see it? The power of silence is great, not jumping in. So I think that's one. The other is I'm somebody, and it probably frustrates some people. I like to sleep on things. I like to consider it. I like to put a bit of time between a a question or an event and the next conversation or maybe helping somebody with a solution. Sleeping on things is really important. And look, we've we've I'm sure we've both been in situations where work isn't that much fun. You've got to downsize. You've got to have conversations with people which result in them not maybe not having a job anymore. They're not fun conversations. But they're necessary conversations. That's part of leadership. And I think if you can check where you're coming, are you coming from the best place? The other, you talked about what kind of talk, it's not taking things personally. I learned that a long time ago that, you know, people will say, I don't know what, how other people are living their lives. I don't take things personally. I don't assume to know what other people are thinking. That's taken a long time as well. And I think those two things are are really important. And the other is I try and show up and be the best version of myself. Doesn't always happen. Life gets in the way and you haven't got control over what happens externally, but you do have control over your response to it and your reaction. So I try not to be reactive. And sometimes it's physical. It's actually, as I say, counting or taking a breath because there is an almost an instinctive physical reflex to come back with something. And I have found for me in my life, if I can control that reflective access impulse, I always, always have a better outcome. So for those of us that shoot from the hip and wear our hearts on our sleeve, how do we do that? Well, how do we learn it? Like what's the path to learning some of those techniques? Well, I think the first thing is being a bit insightful about yourself. And I mean, I I think you can sit down and we've all got history. So you go, you can look back on experiences that you have and go, was that the best thing I did? I don't think we do debriefs very well. I think when an event has occurred, normally we're just in the middle of the next event. But I think if we can sit back and go, okay, this happened. This is how I responded. Was that the best way I could have responded? Because you're going to have for future situations. And I like to think that I learn a little bit from every adverse situation. As as I said before, you, you learn much more from adversity than things going great. So I don't think there's a single situation that's ever happened in my life where I don't think I could have done it a bit better. When I have shot from the hip, when I have been immediately responsive, I haven't had the best outcome. So learning from that and going, now that I'm, I guess, more mature, to be honest, and had a bit more experience in my bank, I go, all right, let's think about things. And also, let's not deny the other person, presuming that it's an interaction with somebody else, going through that discovery themselves, you know, and listening. Listening's a big one, isn't it? It's It's a huge one. You talk about adversity. Do you have any examples that come to mind of situations that you've had to face? What skills you found have helped you face them? My uh, background was outdoor education and, and that's really where I learned my leadership style, if you like. So I did a fabulous master's degree at Griffith University in outdoor education. It was hands-on, you know, lead climbing, kayaking, hiking, all of those things. And feedback is immediate and it's profound. So going back to, you know, kids forgetting a raincoat, you're going to get wet, cold, probably sick. Going the wrong direction with your map and compass can have very significant consequences. So I like that environment 
where your environment is giving you constant feedback of your decision making. And there's always choices to be made. And there are sometimes better choices and worse choices, but there's very rarely only one choice. I think that has been very useful for me because, you know, Rob, you're a runner, you're, and I'm not, but I'm sure that if you're running a distance, your mood and your physicality and mental state is going through a roller coaster. You know, where one minute, and certainly for me, with being in the outdoors, you're going, this is fantastic. Conditions are favorable. The sun's shining. I know where I'm going. I can see my campsite. Everybody's happy. We've got enough food and water, and everything's great. Something happens. Israel, you just want to go home. You go, why didn't I, why did I even leave home? So in a day, you have these real, it's quite an emotional roller coaster. And that I find interesting. And when you, when you translate that to life, I think it helps you understand that everything's impermanent. If you're miserable and things are horrible, that's impermanent. It's going to change. This too will pass. Equally, and a bit sadly, if you're really deliriously happy, that's going to pass as well. So I think that understanding when you're in adversity, that it's a temporary situation. And trying to explain that to other people is sometimes difficult, especially if they haven't had so many experiences. So again, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I I think that you only really learn from adversity and you have to let other people learn from that and take their own learnings away from it. And as I said before, sometimes that takes years. I know that I've made people unhappy in the workplace and other places, but I believe it was the right thing. And I also believe that in the long run, they will be better off as well. So I, 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 and maybe, and this is going to show my age, maybe we are too quick at creating a softer environment and taking away adversity and being staying in that comfort zone or extending that comfort zone a little bit so I don't know that's something I kind of I'm very interested in that you've just done a really interesting trip which included a component that I'd be fascinated to hear about your 10-day silence retreat talking about things that must be difficult. Yeah, I struggle with the idea of 10 days without having without being able to talk. What's that experience like? Yeah, look, Rob, it was, so I'm in a career break at the moment. I gave, and for the first time in 30 years, I gave up my job that I loved, that I really liked with people I really liked, left it on a high and didn't know my next move. But one of the things that I had an opportunity to do, and I'm a big believer in the right thing comes along at the right time. And there was an opportunity to go on a 10 day Vipassana retreat, which is, as you say, silent meditation, meditating 11 hours a day. Again, in my typical way, didn't know too much about it, didn't Google it. You know, I could have just watched lots and lots of YouTube. So I thought, no, I want to know what it does for me. So, and it was, it was 11 hours a day of meditation. So physically challenging because you're sitting and mentally probably was the hardest because we have, mon- I have a monkey mind. And so as soon as you sit still, everything comes in, you know, like I replayed entire movies in my head. So that was really challenging. But I wanted a circuit breaker from being in the corporate world and whatever came next, which was a bit of an unknown. And for me, it was the perfect thing at the perfect time. It was also a lesson in, so there were the 15 of us started, 12 of us finished. You couldn't talk to anybody. You couldn't make eye contact. You couldn't acknowledge anyone else. There were six women and we ended with six men and you were in their presence. And at the end of it, when we could speak on the 11th day, you came to know people through presence. And I'd never even looked anyone in the eye. And there was a a sense of camaraderie. It was it was really quite amazing. It was, you know, even if it was just a social experiment, it was amazing. It was a fantastic gift I gave to myself. It helps me stop uh, everything that I've been talking about. It's kind of magnified that or amplified that. My ability to stop and just calm, breathe and sense sensations. It wasn't spiritual. It wasn't religious. It was just looking at how external things that happen impact us physically and emotionally. But it is a little bit, Rob, it's one of those things you've got to do it. 
you know, it's, it's quite hard to explain. It's like try and think of a new colour. I was a little bit amazed that I sat for, you know, I'm a bit like you, I move around a lot. But, you know, I sat for 10 and a half days, but oh, I loved it. I really loved it. Did you have any kind of practice leading up to it? Like, have you been in, into meditation for a long time or had you done any shorter retreats before? I did a couple. So only this year. So New Year this year, I did a five-day retreat in the Grampians and I loved it. It was yoga and meditation and not, not a silent retreat. I did that. And then I did a weekend silent retreat. But it's something I've been thinking about for quite a long time. And in reality, I suppose I do practice You know, when I go back to what I was saying about pausing before I respond to something, in a way, that is the kind of embryo of, of meditation is, is not being reactive to things. So I had started to try and practice that over the last few years of just not being reactionary, but certainly not sit down and consciously meditate. No. What's next in the Jasquith story? You're a beautiful story, Pella. I love it. I love, I love spending time with you. What's next? Well, I'm in my van. I am a little bit like my backpack. I can't put anything extra into the van unless I take something out. So I love that finite space. There's nothing in my van that is surplus to requirement, but everything in my van I need. I've been sleeping in my van for seven weeks now. I love van life. I love being outdoors. I I'm an outdoor, which is ironic because I kind of grew up in the east end of London. But, but that's my orientation is is to be outdoors i'm purposely rob not looking for something else i so my immediate plans are working my way back up to my home which is magnetic island i'd be there at the end of the month i've still got a few camps to go and then doing a few things on the island and then in january heading off to central america and i'm going to do what we have been directing for a long time. I'm going to go and stay in Colombia and Guatemala in a homestay family and go to school and learn Spanish. So between January and May, that's where I'll be. And maybe the oldest homestay student in Guatemala, I don't know, but that's what I, I intend to do. So I'll be the student. I've had English language centers for about 20 years. So the idea that I'm going to be doing that is exciting and scary. My, my last question, and maybe, maybe Maureen's got, got more, but my last question is really around the career break. You've been in leadership positions for, for many years. You've got lots of experience and Uh, probably had had your fair share of pressure too. So taking a career break, I think people maybe get to that kind of point and they're like, oh, yeah, I'll take a break. But do you think it's also valuable for people to consider doing that earlier in their careers as well? Look, it's a good question. I suppose you can only draw on your own experience. I've spoken to lots of people and they go, oh, women over 40 don't get jobs. When you're If you leave higher education, you'll never get back. In. All, you know, all of that rhetoric and, and kind of fear mongering. I have always been somewhat surprised at my next move and it's always been better than my last one. And, and I think Martha Johnson, if you know, I think she calls it serendipitous happenstance. Things that I'm very good at is saying yes to things. I don't wait until... I've got all the information or all the qualifications, but if I see an opportunity and there's a, I can get a bit of a foot in the door, I just say yes. And then I, you know, I kind of build the ship as it's sailing and get the skills that are needed as we go. And so I, I have thought about that and I spoke to a couple of people, you know, taking a career break, not having a job, what, it, what will be next for me? And I don't know. I don't know what will be next for me. But I led an organisation in Melbourne through COVID where we had, I had 288 days of lockdown and ran a successful biz training organisation and we grew in that time. And look, not just me, my leadership team and all the staff and everybody involved did a fantastic job of making that happen. I don't take credit for that. It was an amazing group of people to work with. I think having done that, that I didn't quite realise how much that, how exhausting that was until I kind of came out the other side of it. Because part of what I thought I needed to do was to keep everyone buoyed up and keep motivation happening as we all work from home. And people were, some people had horrendous situations working from home. I was very fortunate. 
But I felt a responsibility. Every Friday, I had a Friday forum at four, I called it, FFS. And and I brought in drag bingo. I brought in art classes, you know, because I wanted to keep everyone motivated. Lots of stories there. That's another podcast. So I think taking a pause now is valid. And I don't think that we have quite the same negative connotations about career breaks. You know, I, 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 and I don't know what's next. Who knows? I'm going to spend four months in, in Colombia and, and Guatemala and I'm going to meet people I haven't met yet. Who knows what is going to come from that? So I'm very open to what's next and it could be very, very different. It sounds so exciting. All the best for it, Joe. Thank you so much. You're doing a, such a great job. And, you know, storytelling, I think, is one of the most powerful mediums. You know, we, we work with quantitative data, and but it's people's stories. And, and I think that what you do is fabulous. And your stories, Rob, I, you know, I always love them. Thanks, Joe. It's funny, the conference, the AIEC conference next year, the theme is the human element. And when I, that popped up, I just went, stories, 100%. It's the stories of the people in, in our industry. It's the stories of the students that we affect literally day in, day out. That is the human element and has been the human element for hundreds of thousands of years. So I'm hoping over the next 12 months, we see a lot more stories just like these ones. You know, the, pro- the problem with this, Marine, is that we need to have jo- we need to connect with you and have you like... No, I was going to say, we, we need to have Jo again after she comes back from yeah. her trip because I want to hear about it. I, we, unfortunately, we can't go with her, so I'd like to know about it. <laughs> I'd quite happily come to Central America. <laughs> I, I was thinking more selfishly, like like having sitting around a campfire somewhere and just oh, that'd be nice. talking a night away, mm. sharing sharing more of these yarns. Mm. That was Definitely. Well, we were nearly in Corsica together, so I, I, I think that you and I are definitely cross paths yeah we that's right we'd end up in Corsica what like in 30 k's from each other or something like that just by chance isn't that funny but I do want to can I tell one student story please oh yes you know I I I talked before about I I think when when Rob and I were working in internet first started in international education I started in the late 90s and we were building the ship as it was sailing because we were always the square peg in the round hole at universities and I remember I was teaching outdoor education and the head of international, and most of my students were international, and they talked me into coming and working at the international office. And I remember being there. We had no outbound exchange, and this would have been maybe 2001. It was a regional university. And I remember these two human movement students, Australian students, coming into my office, and they said, we've just been to China, and we've been studying for a year in China, and they had a transcript in Mandarin. Do you think we could get credit for what we're doing? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I had no idea what they were talking about. Anyway, we, there was a lecturer who was Chinese. I brought him in. He translated the transcript. He said, yeah, he said they've studied in China. How they did that, I don't know. They just had this idea of going there. I don't even know if they took a leave of absence. They certainly weren't on an exchange program at all. I went to the head of human movement at the university, and who was a fabulous guy, who went, I, I think we could give them credit, and ultimately did. And they got and what an amazing thing they did. You know, talk about leading the sector. We did things that I think were extraordinary to lead the sector, but so did the students. You know, there was no playbook. There was no manual. When I left that university, we had hundreds of students going out on different exchange experiences. But it started with these crazy people, both staff and students, who just took it on their own back and did things. And then afterwards, we were madly writing. I think I wrote a policy on exchange after that, you know, and said, yes, yes, yes. You know, these were the students we sent to China and, you know, retrospectively put them into some kind of program so that they could get credit. So I just wanted to acknowledge that that kind of saying yes to things and not being put off by, oh, we don't, you know, it, 
I mean, admission systems never suited what we were trying to do. It was always like, no, you can't do that. It doesn't fit the visa or whatever. But we did it anyway. And then we would try and retrofit it into something. So I think there's a lot of credit to be taken in the generation that was, you know, kind of before my time that really pioneered this stuff, didn't take no for an answer, wasn't, I don't think, massively supported by the institutions necessarily that they worked in, but enabled us to be doing what we're doing today and what we've been doing through our career. So I just wanted to tell that story about students because that's a story. And, you know, it can be told now because presumably those guys have graduated and they're in the workplace. They can't have their degree reneged or anything like that because it wasn't a legitimate program. But what a fantastic. And there's tens and hundreds of those stories. It it just the thing that, that really stands out clearly to me there is how the stability and the success that we take for granted these days really does stand on the foundations of the innovators who were prepared to push the envelope. And I think that's something that we always need to keep in mind, not just in our, in our work, but in, in life in general as well. Totally. Joe, for the second time, <laughs> thanks for joining us on Global Horizons. What fun. Until next time. All right, and I'll definitely catch up with you soon. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.